what we are in the industry is the leader, I think. I mean, as far as innovation, as far as production, I, th I think that we're the biggest, but I can't tell you that. My name is Don Levin, and I founded and I'm the chairman of the Republic Group. The Republic Group is a group of companies that are located in Western Europe, Canada, and the United States that all are involved with the rolling paper business. The main brand is OCB for a branding. Then we have Zigzag, we have Job, we have a body, we have Easy Wider. We're the, we call it plant to puff when we talk about the paper industry. Our hemp paper all comes from Champagne, France. So we go to a cooperative and we actually know the farmers. We can say, this is the farmer that's growing our hemp. And, and so that hemp, we know where it came from, we know what field it came from, and we know through, because tracing, we can tell you in which booklet it's in and tell you where it went. So we go from plant to puff. We're the whole supply chain. So I was working for Nortel Oldsmobile in Chicago in 1969. And for whatever reasons, I didn't like working in the car business. It was pretty staid, it was pretty suit and tie. I had gotten out of the Marines recently. And a friend of mine named Shelley Miller, who just gotten out of the Navy, he and I were talking, and there was a store that he knew of that was owned by a guy like Neil Swivish. And Neil's son was Adam. And he had made this little store. It was like a boutique, I thought. And his owner's name was Adam's Apple, son's name. And he had a beautiful psychedelic sign painted on the window. And he wanted, he was moving to Colorado. So we decided we'd buy that store, and we did buy that store. And because of the beautiful window, we didn't change the name. I remember when I was doing this, my father, who was a used car dealer, thought it was on my mind. What are you doing? You're leaving. You, you can work for General Motors. You can, you know. It was an opportunity for me to be entrepreneurial. And I was entrepreneurial. And I really, I loved it. I still love it. During the next few years, we had a retail store, and I found that I wasn't much into retail. But more importantly, days after we opened the store, I bought everything in the store, everything else except the cigarette papers. N no rolling papers. I said, I didn't want any part of that. Other Marines, I didn't even know what they were. So everybody came in the store from everywhere saying, I, gee, I want rolling papers. And after about three days of that, I called Neil and said, Neil, I need the cigarette papers. And we started selling those. There was bamboo, there was Marfil, there was Blanco y Negro. All came from New York. But we order them, you have to send money, and then two or three months later, you get the papers. And I, I didn't understand that. So what I came to find out is that they get a bunch of money and then eventually order it. It would come to New York and they'd send it to you and mark it up a lot. And just being an entrepreneurial, I said, you know, I can go to Europe and buy it. I don't need to buy it from a guy in New York. And I did. The problem was, when you bought it from Europe, you had to buy so many. Now I had to figure out a way to get rid of them because I didn't have that many retail customers. So, Adams Apple Distributing Company was formed. So we did that, and then the weekends I traveled to various different places to sell these papers and get them. Time goes on, I keep going back and forth, and I'm in Madrid, Spain, which is the headquarters of Papalaras Reunidas, which is the paper company that made bamboo. And I'm going to Holland for the weekend, so you stop in a place called Perpignan, France. Every train stopped there and every, because they had to change the rails or change trains. In Perpignan, I see that they make cigarette papers there and they make job. I'm thinking, well, the French cigarette papers, the big one in the United States is zigzag. And I'm going now to Paris. So I get to Paris and I get on my look in the phone book and I can read zigzag in French because it's zigzag. And I call up the office and say, I'm interested in importing papers in the United States, can somebody talk to me? I'm at the train station, I have four or five hours before I have to be on the train to Holland. So they said, come over, meet a man named Patrick Emery, and I'm talking about bringing cigarette papers to the United States, I'd like to get an exclusive on cigarette papers. I'm talking about five minutes, and I finally said the name Zigzag. He said, no, 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 Zigzag's on the fourth floor. You're on the third floor, this is job. I said, oh, I'm in the wrong places, but wait. 
I said, okay, I'll wait. He said, we made these papers called Roll It Sweet, we had 5,000 boxes of each one. And those 5,000 boxes were made for somebody in California that made a, gave us a letter of credit, but it was a phony letter of credit. So we got them. If you'll take these, we'll give you the exclusive on job in the United States. I said, okay. We write a contract, we sign it, and we're off. I'm now the exclusive distributor job in the United States. Time goes on selling job, and it's doing really well. The 80s come around, and a fellow named Vassant Bolleray, he rolls up all the cigarette paper companies. But he closes the zigzag production facility. He closes all the other production facilities because job has the best production facility in Perpignan. So he does the roll up. Everything's fine. I have a good relationship with the factory and they're making me money and we're bringing them projects. And the workers got screwed. And the workers are gonna strike and they've never seen this. This is bad, if they strike, it's gonna close me down. So I decided to go meet Mr. Bowler. I don't know who he is, and I got a big mouth. And so I go in and I, I actually I'm very rude in telling him that he's not the smartest guy and he's doing screwing this up and sell me the company because I care about it and he doesn't. And he says, okay. He says, nobody's ever spoken to me like this. I said, well, somebody should talk to you like that. I am, till this day, sorry I said those words. Turned out to be the smartest man I've ever met. So he says, what should I do? I tell him what I'll do. And, he, and then he explains that OCB, the last letter, is Bolleray. And it's his family business, and they started in 1800 and something. And he'll never sell it because it's his family business, no matter what else he does. I said, okay, that's fine. But he says, what should I do? And, I said, well, you should get rid of this guy and bring in somebody else and do, and he does all the things I suggest and everything works out fine. But before I leave that day, he says, if I ever sell it, I'm going to sell it to you. Okay, you're never going to sell it. I don't think about it. 2000 comes around, I get a phone call. He says, okay, I'm selling you the brand. I'm selling you the company. He says, come to Paris. I've got you a loan from BNP. This is how much it is. This is what we'll do. Don't worry about it. Just come. You just have to have this little money to put down and you can have it. I said, we negotiating? He says, no. I, he's, he's, he said a number. I said, dollars or euros? He said, dollars. I said, euros, because euros were 82 cents. He said, okay, euros. And went to France and he had met the people from BNP who I'd never met before. And, oh, here, I'll sign this paper for you. I ended up with the brands. I ended up with the company. So we got on his plane. We fly to Perpignan, France. And he explains to them that, okay, I just sold the company to him. I'm leaving, take care. And they're upset. And I said, okay, I've been dealing with you people for 1972, it's, not, it's 2000, you know me. It's not like it's gonna be a new people, but I'm gonna stay on the factory floor and, and I'm gonna answer any question you're gonna ask me. I'm gonna talk to every employee here, I want every employee out there. It took me two days standing there to answer everybody's question. And since then, we've, it's been just wonderful. I started in 1969, and Normal started in 1970, National Organization for Reform Marijuana Laws. I'm not a marijuana smoker, and only because if I do, I sit in the corner and drool. I would just never been that I, I It just doesn't react well with my body. It bothered me, I never could, but I don't. But I was always the designated driver and I was always fun to be around anyway, so. So after we start getting job papers, we start selling the stores and stores go on and the stores are saying, gee, besides papers, I, you know, I, I need roach clips. And so, so, okay, so we can make roach clips. We smell roach. And then, you know, you ever have a bong? I said, not really, but what is it? I can get it, right? So, and chillums, and then we had pipes, and then we had, the, so we became the Sears of paraphernalia. We were the big boy in town for that. So we got into that, but then Jimmy Carter did the paraphernalia stuff that was, it started in the South in Georgia, I want to think. They started enforcing it, and I had one friend get house arrest. One person I knew that wasn't a friend of mine got 104 months in prison. Another one in Pennsylvania had 
70-some-year-old parents that worked in his business with him, and the Fed said to him, you know, if you don't plead guilty to this, we're going to arrest your parents. But we fought, we formed an association, we hired William Kunstler as, as an attorney. He did the Chicago 7, he did Bobby Rush, he, he was, for the time, he was a big time lawyer. So we fought and we fought and we fought, it didn't work out. We were threatened, we were raided by the DEA and we, we had like 40 or 50 people in our warehouse. And I said, okay, I'm out. And we got rid of everything, except papers. Because in the, in the law, in the written paraphernalia law, it, it said, it, if, if, we, you know, if it was papers were okay. And the decision was that white papers were okay. So then it went on and became, we became Republic Tobacco because we wanted to disengage from this paraphernalia because they were, it was really difficult. I remember coming into the country and coming through customs and being pulled aside and going into rooms. and It was not a fun time to have your name on a list. Things have loosened up. So paraphernalia or vape stores or what are you going to call smoke shops have opened. Hopefully, as this gets more sophisticated and becomes more uh, centralized, it'll be a more normalized business. It should be legal. That's my opinion. It's an underground environment. It, it makes people disregard the law. They don't like the laws. They don't like police because of it. There's a lot of racial innuendo to, to this kind of enforcement. Is there a benefit to making it legal? Yeah, you'd probably make the courts a lot freer. You'd probably make the police a lot freer. It's not like when they go legal, all of a sudden, gee, I'm going to sell so many more papers. It, it doesn't work that way. It's there. Everybody knows it's there. Why are we being difficult? I don't know. A legalization is going to change things dramatically. I don't know who will be good for it, who will be bad for it. But I think it's going to happen, but I think the result is going to be different than people think. The end result will be that distribution will go to a very organized distribution system, be it alcohol or tobacco. I can't imagine that the U.S. government's going to open up and say to somebody, okay, you have to re-establish all these things that already exist. The deciding factor is going to be taxes. Taxes are going to be an important part of legalization and they're going to want their taxes and they know that the cigarette companies will do that and the liquor companies will do it. They'll pay the taxes. They know how to do it. They've already got it set up and it's going to be a lot of money. A lot of money. The difference between success and failure is taking a risk, right? So why is our company the way our company is. And I think because I was willing to take a risk both ways, be it for something or against something. And the people come to me with things and say, well, this is the greatest thing ever. And I said, but does it fit in with me selling job cigarette papers? Does, does it fit in with that? Do I have the same people? Is it the same customer? Do I have the same phone call? And if it didn't, I wouldn't do it. So I didn't get into manufacturing certain other things. There was, there was Bernie Karp was the first guy that would, they had bongs. Rather than try to compete with them and say I could do everything, I would buy theirs and just add them on to the things I sold. And then to get out was another risk. You say, okay, I'm making this much money, but the risk is I'll go to jail, right? So I said, okay, I'm gonna take the risk the other way and get out. So the secret to all of this is just when you see something, most people don't do anything about it. It's like saying, boy, that stock went down, I should have bought it. Well, why didn't you buy it then? Life is just a series of decisions, and if you're willing to take risk, I think you can, get, you can succeed. If you're not willing to take risk, don't do it. Entrepreneurship is risk-taking. Being where I am now is much more than I ever expected, and it's important to know why. And the, the why is my ability is to get, find smart people and leave them alone. I mean, I am good at finding good people, and, and just support them, and they, they do all the work. There was a story I heard about Walt Disney many, many years ago, and I don't know how true it is, may not be true. So he's talking to a young girl, and this it could be all BS. But basically, Mr. Disney used to draw Mickey Mouse. He said, no, I don't. She said, well, do you still do this? And he said, no, I don't. Well, do you still do that? And you know, she says, Mr. Disney, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm like a butterfly. I go from plant to plant, and I make things bloom. 
That's my legacy. And that's, that's where I am today, but it's not where I expected to be. I thought I'd be selling cars on Western Avenue in Chicago.